and introduce what I do. I work in the pesticide program for the Utah Department of Agriculture and Food. Uh, we live by label is the law in the pesticide program. On every label under directions for use, it says it's a violation of federal law to use this product in a manner inconsistent with its labeling. I'm gonna take labeling a little different direction. I'm gonna talk about labeling in the agricultural applicator. You'd be surprised at some of the things that agricultural applicators have. Um, <clears throat> Anyway, an agricultural applicator uh, in Utah, people ask us why we don't worry too much about the agricultural applicator. Uh, we have, and here's why. In enforcement activity in 2019, we had 369 cases and we had four enforcement actions on the agricultural applicator. That incurred, included commercial that applied on agricultural land. And so that's 1.08% uh, of agricultural applicators that had a violation. But agricultural applicators, 20% of our licensed applicators are apply in agriculture. So we're not too worried about that. I'm gonna introduce myself. <clears throat> I'm an old bureaucrat. Uh, Mayor got the introduction mostly right. <clears throat> As an old bureaucrat, uh, I've been branded like that previous commissioner wanted, wanted us to be branded to show our brand. Uh, I'm not going to tell you where because then I'd get arrested. But um, I have, uh, uh, here's my credentials down here, BS in biology agriculture from Southern Utah University. You see Mr. Magoo top right, that's what my kids call me sometimes because I don't hear or see too well. And then at work, a lot of people refer to me as Eeyore because I'm pretty laid back and easy going. Um, we're gonna talk about worker protection standard and law and, and label for the private applicator. When you talk about private applicators, to me, uh, it's pretty much worker protection standard. Here's some contact information. You notice my email address is much larger than my phone number. Um, that's my the primary way I like people to contact me with questions about Utah law. It, and that the reason being is I can link them up with some answers to their questions on the internet. Um, notice again down here, directions for use. Uh, we're going to talk about the label today, and you're going to get some of that stuff in there. It's a violation to use this product in a manner inconsistent with its labeling. That might help some of you people in Nevada answer some questions too. Uh, we're supposed to make these interesting, and I have a hard time making them interesting, so I'm going to show you a video. Uh, anyway, uh, Utah participation question. Where does the presenter work? Okay. And there's there's the possibilities for an answer. Uh, oh, Drew, this is one of the questions that they need to send you the answer to. Before. This is okay. one of the questions you need to send the answer to. And there's a reminder for that. Nevada. If other states want to answer the question, that's I'll send them a certificate. Okay, let's see. I think I've got another question already. Uh, Utah pesticide licensees should answer all the questions and send their answers with their license number to that email address to get one CEU in law, true or false. That was an easy one. Now we're going to talk about this here little video. I show this video in all my presentations and all of my presentations are about law. That's what we've been asked to do. But this presentation uh, kind of brings home everything, it brings it all together. This was published in the Journal of Pesticide Safety Education in 2006, which is a long time ago, I know, but it still has an important message. 
if you look at the if you look at the picture we've got here and it's not a very good picture i tried to find a newer sharper version and can't find it but uh, this is probably better than most i've shown in the past um, the guy on the left is spraying a mango tree and the younger man on the right is dragging a hose for the guy on the left you can assume that they're probably father and son they're on a mango plantation in india there's many points i'm going to bring home with this example uh, one of the points is, uh, er, well, there's several points. The man on the left, we can, uh, we're told in, if you read through the research, uh, he's about 42 years old. The person on the right is about somewhere between 12 and 14 years old. And the person on the left is about to end his career. He's probably quite ill from chronic pesticide exposure. The person on the right is just beginning his uh, career on the mango plantation. Can I interrupt you? I'm so sorry, Drew. No problem. So there's a couple of people that didn't get the questions. Uh-oh. And so just to be clear for everybody in Utah, this is offering one pesticide applicator credit in law. And you must answer four questions and email mm -hmm. your answers to Drew. So um, the first question was, where do I work? Oh, where does Drew work? Uh huh. Okay. And the second question is, do you send it to D Matthews at Utah.gov? Okay. The answers to the four questions. All right. Thanks. Drew Sorry about folks. that. I'd give you the answer, but then that's way too easy. <laughs> uh, there, uh, anyway, this study worked on these people at uh, these people and, and looked at what they could do to extend the lifespan. The fellow on the left is about to die of chronic pesticide poisoning. He's about 42 years old, that's all. They identified one thing that could extend their lifespan by 10 years. The one thing that, and when I do a live presentation, I can hear lots of people answer that question. People that have seen my presentations can answer it pretty readily. Most people answer that the they could wear better PPE. Why? While better PPE certainly would help, uh, the answer to the question is they need to wash their hands before they go to the bathroom and before they eat, drink, or smoke, okay? Now that's relatively easy. Uh, so here's another participation question. What's the primary consideration of a pesticide applicator when trying to limit chronic pesticide exposure? Answer that question. Now, in that previous slide, it kind of brings home some of the things that we're talking about today, one of them being worker protection standards, and one of them being what we're doing here. Uh, we're becoming informed about our pesticide use. We're becoming informed about pesticide law and about things we can do to be safe, things we can do to comply with the law, and things we can do to, to uh, uh, keep the public safe, okay, uh, and address problems with pesticide exposure. So uh, when it gets down to it, uh, that slide is really important. Uh, protections during applications. Uh, there's a WPS label statement on about every, every uh, container of pesticide. And this is the lab label statement. Do not apply this product in a way that contacts workers or other persons, either directly or through drift. Only protected handlers can be in the area during the application. 
Now this kind of goes goes to say if this is on every label, then every applicator needs to abide by these problem by by this statement. Um, it's in almost every label. There are some that it's not there. Who's responsible for compliance with the label? Okay. We're introducing a new term you might have heard here. Now, I call typically call somebody that's out spraying, I call them a pesticide applicator. Uh, sometimes applicator is used for, uh, is the term for the equipment you're using to put pesticide out. But who is protected by the label directions? Workers and other persons beside protected handlers. Handlers are the people uh, that apply the pesticides or an applicator. Is the protection a stout limited to boundaries of an agricultural establishment? No, it extends beyond the boundaries of the agricultural establishment to the public. A lot of private applicators have to do food safety. And when they do food safety, uh, uh, this worker protection standard falls in line. But really what they're doing is they're protecting the public, the, the consumers from uh, unsafe practices with pesticides and with other things, biologicals, other chemicals and, and products that can get in and and decrease the safety of food. Here's some definitions. An agricultural establishment. Uh, these are EPA definitions, okay? An agricultural establishment is a farm, forest, nursery, greenhouse. It can include some other places, okay? An agricultural commodity is a crop or a plant grown on a farm. Well, people say, well, doesn't it have to be eaten? Well, no, it doesn't. There's ornamentals out there that are considered crops and plants that are grown on a farm. For example, turf or maybe pansies you buy at a greenhouse or a nursery. A worker is an employee of an agricultural establishment. Now, I already mentioned handler. A handler is an employee of an agricultural establishment who handles pesticides. Now, a certified applicator, and this can be different from state to state, but a certified applicator is a person in EPA size that's able to train workers and handlers on being safe around pesticides. And, and they're not subject to some parts of WPS because they have a license. Okay, a certified applicator has a license from a state that allows them to train workers and handlers, and it allows them to be exempt from parts of worker protection standard because they already have that knowledge as an applicator, as a certified applicator. We'll talk towards the end about why that's important. Here's some more definitions. You need to know what a restricted entry interval is. The applicator, of course, is probably the only person that should be around the pesticide when it's being applied. The restricted entry interval is after it's been applied or during when it's been applied. After it's been applied, nobody should go into that area after it's been applied. That's a restricted entry interval. That's the time you, you don't, don't go in there. Now, when I do worker protection standard, when I inspections, I suggest to my people that if they're following WPS rules or if they need to, they need to have an REI policy for their operation. And that usually should be nobody goes in there except a licensed applicator. That makes it easier because then you don't have to train them as a handler or an early entry worker. An early entry worker is somebody that enters the area. In Utah, the biggest example of that would be somebody that needs to go in there to, do, to irrigate, okay? Um, and what on a family type operation, that's usually the kids go in to irrigate. 
And before 2015, they could go in and irrigate as long as they were wearing proper PPE. And they could go in and irrigate and do their thing and that was fine. Now under the new worker protection standard rules since 2015, the, if their relatives, direct relatives of the family farmer, uh, they have to be 16 years or old or older to go in there and irrigate and be wearing the proper personal protective equipment. If they're not related, they have to be 18 years old or older. Now this gives heartburn to a lot of people, uh, but if you adopt the policy that during that restricted entry interval, which might be 24 or 48 hours, the longest one I've seen is five days, during that period, if the applicator, licensed applicator is the one that takes over irrigation, then that's not a problem. So uh, I advise people to adopt that policy. An REI policy, nobody goes in there but the licensed applicator during the re-entry interval. Worker protection standard, here's who it applies to. This is directly from uh, EPA. And they say, see the definition of an agricultural establishment, which I just defined for you up here. Farms, forests, nurseries, and greenhouses. Um, here's the definition of a handler. For some reason, trained annually is on there. A handler means any person, including a self-employed person who's an, who is employed by an agricultural establishment. A handler mixes loads, applies pesticides, can dispose of pesticides, can act as a crop advisor, and but there's a whole separate definition for crop advisor. That's why it says nine down there, is that's kind of a different thing. But a handler is a person who applies pesticides but isn't licensed is an easy way to put it. If everybody is licensed, then you don't have to train a handler annually. I advise most of my clients, go get a license. Anybody that applies pesticides around pesticides, they should consider getting a license. Not only so they can uh, do it without having the handler training, they know have more knowledge, but they can also train the workers. Here's the definition of a worker. When do you train workers? You train them annually, okay? Worker means any person who's employed and, re and can be related to the production of the agricultural commodities. I get the question a lot of times, especially in a greenhouse or a nursery, <clears throat> the question is, do I have to train my cashier? Um, well, that's an iffy question. My answer is usually what will the lawyer say? Okay, if the cashier gets injured and it might be a, a part of work, it might not be part of work, can they blame it on pesticides? Well, the, their lawyer can blame it on anything. I would probably train everybody that was a worker around an agricultural establishment. So anybody that works on the farm, I would probably give them the WPS, the Worker Protection Standard Training. Um, <clears throat> we're gonna talk a little bit about agricultural use requirements. Well. I, I often get when I'm doing an inspection, I don't use any pesticides. And uh, sometimes that means they don't use insecticides. Sometimes that means they use what they consider minimal risk pesticides, or sometimes they use uh, uh, home remedies Sometimes they use organic, what they consider organic approved pesticides. In 
the state of Utah, at least, we kind of, in the pesticide program, we ignore the definition of, we ignore the definitions that people use to try and get out a worker protection standard. Because if it's a pesticide, if it's an herbicide, if it's an insecticide, if it's a fungicide, if it's pretty much anything that ends in IDE, it kills something. And we consider that a pesticide. The key to being subject to worker protection standard or not is does it have the agricultural use requirements on the label? Here is an example of agricultural use requirements on the label, okay? Uh, and this happens to be a minimum risk pesticide uh, called mainspring, okay? And it's an insecticide. Uh, this insecticide is to be used in commercial greenhouses only and nurseries, okay? Can be used on sod farms. Okay, and it lists some specific language like I just told you on there, but it has agricultural use requirement. To give you a, a legal interpretation of what agricultural use requirement means, it means if you use this growing a crop, an agricultural commodity on a, on a farm, an agricultural establishment, then you're subject to worker protection standard, okay? If that's on the label. What if it isn't on the label? Okay, here's another minimum use product. The box, the agricultural use requirements is smaller. There's fewer specifics about this chemical. This happens to be another minimum risk pesticide. The reason I'm using the minimum risk is because these things are very, very safe. Uh, and there's very little you have to do to stay safe from these, but you still have to train your workers and your handlers about being safe around pesticides if the agricultural use requirements on the label. Here's a generic version out of the, out of the EPA instructions about worker protection standard, the agricultural use requirements. This is the language that's almost on almost every pesticide label. Uh, here's a participation question. Is the box on the product label? What is the correct answer? Okay, you're selecting the correct answer. It probably should be if it's on the agricultural establishment or you can't use this product with workers present, or the product label is not the basis for worker protection standard. I just went over what's the, ba what's the basis for worker protection standard. Are you subject to worker protection standard? What is on the label? Okay. Should it be on the label? I don't understand that question, but if anyone else, if maybe because I'm just not knowledgeable enough, but if anybody else doesn't chime in and chat, otherwise you can ignore me. Yep. No, not a problem. Okay, the box. The box. Like the worker protection box? Yeah, it's the agricultural use requirement. We refer to it as the box. Is that oh, on the Oh, okay. A couple people said they don't understand in chat. Yeah. I've got three or four. Is so, that box on the label? Okay. Is the ag use requirements on the label? Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. If it isn't on the label, it probably should it probably be on the label if you're applying on an, a product, an agricultural establishment. Okay. There's the questions. Now um let me give you an example i've been to several greenhouses and nurseries and they have a lot of products in in their store side of the greenhouse or nursery and they sell those products sometimes they pull those products off and use them in the greenhouse or the nursery 
Should they be using them if the box is not on the label? Okay. Some of those labels will say for homeowner use only. Some of them will say for not, not for use in a greenhouse or nursery. Okay. I hope I'm giving it away without get actually giving you the answer. Here's a Here's another question. If you don't understand that last one, you can, you can substitute this question. This is a training question. I had 10 questions lined up and I went back to four. But if this box is not on your product label, should you be using the product? There are some products out there that you can use on an agricultural establishment. If but you only want to use it if the pests and the site you're using it for are on the label. So if it kills thrips and on, a nut, on onions and you can use it, it, it will say, and you it not for homeowner use, or it says, doesn't say for who who's supposed to use it. It says for thrips on onions, you could use that product either as a homeowner or on an agricultural establishment. That's kind of ticky, huh? <laughs> so this question could be a replacement for the prior question. Yep. Okay. This I think is there was kind of techy too. <laughs> Any of my questions, you can substitute them just get them on the email somehow okay so you only need you guys only need to answer four so you right. could skip the prior one if you wanted to you okay. can answer them all if you want to and if you answer four correct we'll get you credit okay there are training questions throughout this it helps us learn outdoor production there's this thing called agricultural exclusion zone and I don't want to dwell on agricultural exclusion zone very much. Uh, agricultural exclusion zone is just, it, it just boils down to common sense. Um, the agricultural exclusion zone came in in 2015 and it gave a lot of us a lot of heartburn. Uh, I had applicators and I used to use the example, I had uh, somebody I would consider a good friend of mine who's an applicator and is has a farm and uh, on his farm he leases several partials down where I live in Syracuse. One of the partials he used to lease now it's he turned it he it's not in production anymore but he used to lease a 40 acre partial right next to McDonald's. He uh, raised he, alfalfa hay on that partial. Uh, he sprayed for uh, aphids and weevil on that partial, okay? He had to observe the agricultural exclusion zone on that partial. And he came within 20 feet of the drive-through at McDonald's. How was he supposed to observe an agricultural exclusion zone when it says you can't apply within a hundred feet of, of that drive-through because people are there. Uh, it's been changed that now that it's on the property that you're, you're using, uh, outdoor production 25 feet or a hundred feet around the equipment and it's based on the application method but it's also based on the property where you're applying. Uh, it's based on uh, the things you see here, the type of equipment you're using, the nozzles you're using, uh, how it's applied. Is it a fumigant? Is it a smoke? Is it a mist? Is it a fog? Uh, is it a spray? Uh, there's lots of different things. How far is your 
nozzles above the ground. Uh, when you start talking about these kind of things to people that live, that try to farm around, around many neighbors in places like Syracuse, uh, it gets pretty confusing. It's impossible to enforce all of this. So we're back to common sense and drift. What it boils down to is if you can apply, in his case, if he can apply on that 40 feet of property and not drift over onto the McDonald's property, he can do it, okay? He has to determine what equipment he uses, et cetera, not to drift over on that property. And that's about the bottom line. Here's some droplet size relations to the agricultural exclusion zone and tells you what you can do. Uh, 100 foot, 25 feet. Now here's a video. I'm gonna let you make up your own mind. This video was shot by a homeowner in Utah. And let see if you can tell me why the homeowner was upset. Okay. Play it again just for fun. I want guess amongst yourselves. You can type it in the questions if you'd like. How close do you think that airplane begins its application to the person shooting the video? Is it within 100 feet? So they're inside the application exclusion zone. This was taken before, the video was taken before the application exclusion zone became part of the rule of worker protection standard. But uh, my answer would be uh, under the worker protection standard, yeah, they're too close, okay? I sampled the area over the property line closest to the residence and it proved positive for what was being applied by the airplane. But I did it for drift. And that's how we prove the agricultural exclusion zone has been violated. This came out in 2015. I want you to notice how good this pilot is. He can turn on a dime and stay in the air. And they're spraying the agricultural they're spraying the zone anywhere in red is the agricultural exclusion zone. You can't be in that area or they have to stop. When it's over, they get this. Here's another little clip. They're spraying that agricultural exclusion zone. Uh oh, there's, and I want you to notice how good this pilot is. He can stop right in the middle of the air. Isn't that great? People move and they can continue and finish the application. I screwed it out and up. Anyway, they, they finished up. Um, this insinuates that you can't spray when your neighbor's too close. Well, you can't drift on your neighbor either. Now you can spray as long as you don't drift on your neighbor. That, that's hard, that's difficult. Here's something new that came in 2015. Here's two types of respirators. You don't have to use those types. If you use a respirator in your operation, now there's things you have to do in order to wear a respirator. There's respirator requirements now, okay? If a respirator is required by the labeling, the handler, who's the applicator, must uh, have a medical evaluation to make sure they can wear a respirator. They have to have a fit test and they have to have respirator training. Okay, and records of all of this has to be kept on the property for two years. So review your label. Uh, oh, I've heard, I only use Roundup. I don't need to use a respirator. Nothing requires a respirator. 
Well, I still haven't confirmed it, but I have heard that if you buy a two and a half gallon jug and mix and load and use that on your agricultural establishment on your farm, uh, you don't have to wear a respirator. If you buy a cube, the label on that cube will require to use a respirator when you mix and load the Roundup. If you're required to use a respirator, you gotta have a medical evaluation to make sure you can wear a respirator and you've gotta have a fit test. And the owner must, the owner of the property or manager must provide respirator training, okay? Uh, and keep records on your property for two years. This gives some people a lot of heartburn. Typically, there are places around, there's a list on our website of where to get the medical evaluation and the fit test done. Utah State University through the PSEP, the Pesticide Safety Education Program Coordinator, Mike Guerta, he has some, he does respirator training annually. And he has, uh, there are some fit test kits out there with some USU extension agents, okay? Uh, people used to come to me and say, I'm exempt. I don't have to do this anymore. Um, or I don't have to do this. All there is that works on this property are me and my spouse and my kids, okay? Well, we used to say, we used to look at you and say, well, that's okay, I'll see you later. Well, now here's the definition of an immediate family. Pretty much anybody you're related to or married into. And here's what, there's no exemption for it being a family farm. It's an agricultural establishment, remember, and it's not exempt from everything. The exemption only co covers the owner and immediate family members, but there's still some provisions they have to comply with. They have to comply with worker protection standard requirements, like I just showed you on risk respirators and fit testing if, the, if it's called for on the label. Now, there might be some commercial applicators out there and so on that say, whew, well, at least I don't get reviewed. Remember, the requirement is on the label. So commercial applicators, non-commercial applicators, if a respirator is required by the label, you have to have the medical clearance and the fit test also, and some training on how to wear that respirator. Uh, providing and using PPE with other work attire is required by the labeling and family members have, still have to do that. So I'm supposed to inspect all the family members and people where other people, commercial people sprayed now, I still have to inspect those places. You still have to follow the AEZ if you're under the family exemption. Okay, uh, again, remember 16 years old or older are the only people that can be handlers in this situation. And you have to follow the label directions. Here's some information on crop advisors. I'm not covering this too handily. Most crop advisors have pesticide licenses. So they're really supposed to know better anyway and don't have to be trained as crop advisors or trained as early entry workers or handlers. They have licenses. Uh, employees are their workers and handlers employed by the establishment. These are questions we ask when we go look at the look at who's subject to worker protection standard when we do the inspections. What do you have to keep records of? You keep your records for two years on the property. You keep records of all of these things, okay? I have, I have this roundup in the driveway question. 
Okay. Uh, go, I go to a farm and they have around their home, around their yard, uh, they have gravel. Okay. Do you, they spray the gravel for weeds, you know, to keep the weeds down and they use Roundup. Do I have to keep records of my Roundup application? I technically, if you get right down to it, you want the nitty gritty, yes or no, you don't. But I always ask, uh, I always ask, and what's the lawyer going to say if you have a train wreck on your property, if you get sued, and they want to know if you did debt worker protection standard, they're going to want to see records on your roundup in the driveway. Okay, so I suggest you keep records on everything now. In the past, Private applicators, agricultural applicators, non-commercial applicators are only required to keep records on restricted use pesticides. Now, because of worker protection standard, you might as well start keeping records on everything that you apply is what this boils down to. What do the application records have to contain? I'm gonna go over that in a second. Records must be kept on all chemicals with the agricultural use requirement on the label, not just restricted use. You keep records on your respirators and the safety equipment, your personal protective equipment. Uh, filters, for example, not only a respirator. If you're spraying and you're using a cab in a tractor or a large sprayer, that cab has filters you need to keep, and you purchase those filters. You need to keep the invoices. Maybe you need to keep a copy with your pesticide records. Keep a copy of when you trade those things around. You need to keep a copy of when you train the workers and handlers that work on your agricultural property. You keep all of these kind of records for two years, okay? There's training of workers. Uh, some of you might want to review that a little bit. I'm gonna kind of hurry along, I'm getting behind. Here's where you can find an example of what you need to keep on your application records, okay? I suggest you search for WPS record sheet, UDAF WPS record sheet, rather than write down that whole, that whole uh, link up there okay along the same line where do you get worker protection standard resources where do you find out about this worker protection standard i'm pushing on you here's additional wps resources here's the links here's what i suggest you search for there's lots of things in this presentation i haven't gone over search for PERC WPS. You're looking to find a how to comply manual. Okay, if you want to know more about worker protection standard and you're an applicator or an owner, manager of property, you want to look at that how to comply manual. It's written in government ease. What we're boiling down here to is I want people to contact me and look at doing an inspection. Here's the material you can get on there, but look for, search for PERC, that's Pesticide Education Resource Collaborative Worker Protection Standard, PERC WPS. You search for those and you can find all the material that you need to, to comply with worker protection or understand if you need to. Here's some items that we talk about when we come doing an inspection and what you have to have when we come do an inspection. Here's some signs that you're supposed to put up during the application. Who puts up those signs? Okay, another learning question here. Uh, you can substitute this one on if you want. 
uh, who should put up the signs? Uh, I can tell you C is wrong. I can tell you B, uh, probably if you hire a commercial applicator to come out and make the application for you, you're still subject to worker protection standard. They probably won't want to put up the signs before they start. So it boils down to A, right? You're responsible to make sure those get put up and it doesn't matter who's doing the application. They have to be put up within 24 hours before and taken down within 48 hours after the application is made. Uh, here's who, who does it, who, what are we talking about when we talk about worker protection standard? It's not necessarily the safety of the people that are making the application. It's pretty much the safety of the people that work on the property. Workers and protected handlers. Here's when they come down within 48 hours after you're done. Um, that's to, so they don't build complacency. All types of employers of workers and handlers and commercial pesticide handler employers. So commercial entities still have to do part of worker protection standard. They have to furnish, uh, the commercial applicator has to furnish the employer or the owner, owner or manager of the agricultural establishment. They have to provide them with a, SDS, an application record, and a label. And they have to comply with some certain things before uh, now that they didn't have to before 2015. All employed handlers and early entry workers, anybody that's around the pesticides during the REI or applying the pesticides has to be 18 years old or older if they're not a relative. 16 years old or older if they are a relative of the owner or manager of the property. Pesticide safety training is provided for workers and handlers annually. Here's what's necessary to provide them and on what. Okay, a lot of information here. Remember, search for PERC WPS. Trainers, who provides this training to the workers and handlers? You got to be a certified applicator to provide the training, or you got to be one of these train the trainer, train officially trained. That's designated by EPA. Bottom line, obtain a license, become, be a certified applicator. If you know people, if you have people that work on your farm, ranch, greenhouse, nursery, or anything that you want. Uh, there, they should be obtained a license. Will you be inspected? If I get a worker protection standard complaint, you'll be inspected. Uh, if you have more than five employees, you should be inspected. Uh, you need an inspection. The first inspection we ever do on a, a certain property is no violations. Uh, we help you get into compliance. We help give you an idea how you can comply. If you're a prominent agricultural establishment, you need an inspection. It's pretty much the same as number two. If you're out there, if you're a thing in the area, I mean, you run a fruit stand, a produce stand, you're open to the public, greenhouse, nursery, stuff like that, you need an inspection regardless of the family thing. If you're a, if you feel you're mostly family exempt and part of the worker protection standard, but you'll never be inspected, that's true. We'll probably never inspect you unless we get a complaint. If you only have one employee and that one employee complains, uh, chances are we'll be coming to inspect you. So pretty much everybody needs to know about it, need to do their best to comply but we'll help you comply. If you feel like you're going to get a complaint, give us a call. 
here's what we feel like you should do. The number, I'm gonna move right down to number four because it's getting late. Obtain your private pesticide applicator's license is the number one thing you can do. Or if you're here for CEU, maintain your private pes your pesticide applicator's license. Commercial people, they can, uh, they maintain a uh, commercial license with uh, agricultural plant on their license. They'll get the information about worker protection standard too. You can always call me for an inspection. We want, we want to dispel fear and we want people around us to be able to call for an inspection if they're worried, if they're concerned about worker protection standard. Don't have a lot of anxiety about it. We'll get you through it. Uh, here's the number one reason. Uh, why should an agricultural establishment have a pesticide applicator, a licensed pesticide applicator on their property? Uh, what do you think? This is my favorite question. There is a pattern in all of those answers too. 